Hey, I'm Warren Sprouse. This is the Bible Forum. We're here every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we're looking at education tonight. Education in America, or is it? The President's Education Secretary has gotten it wrong about homeschoolers and about American education. Homeschooling has been growing in popularity in recent years and now accounts for about 3.4% of all our school age children. That's more than double the percentage of homeschooling families just prior to the turn of the century, 1999. Now that's great news for families who have chosen to give a customized, tailor-made education to their children. And for the millions of families across the country whose children are thriving as a result of choosing to homeschool. However, in speaking to reporters at a breakfast hosted by the Christian Scientist, Science Monitor, Education Secretary John King, conceding that there are homeschooling families who are doing well, told the audience that he worries. He worries that homeschooled students aren't, quote, getting the range of options that are good for all kids, end of quote. According to Politico, King said this is the homeschooling reality unless parents are very intentional about it. He said the school experience includes building relationships with peers, teachers, mentors, elements which are difficult to achieve in homeschooling unless parents focus on it. Now, his comments, his beliefs, are problematic in a number of ways. Number one, it assumes that homeschooled students are not in school. As Milton Friedman famously quipped in Free to Choose, quote, not all schooling is education and not all education is schooling. Many homeschooled students attend some of the most rigorous and intellectually challenging schooling there is. Many families are pursuing a rigorous classical curriculum. Others choose to homeschool because their children wanted more challenging options than their assigned public school would provide. Secondly, research suggests homeschooled students are better prepared for college. Colleges like Hillsdale and Grove City have become renowned for their rigor and high proportion of homeschooled matriculates. Contrary to King's analysis, homeschooled students are in school and they are doing great. Thirdly, what is this rapid instructional experience that students generally receive in the K-12 through education today? Well, according to the most recent National Assessment of Educational Progress administered by the U.S. Department of Education, only one-third of eighth graders in public schools can read proficiently. And proficiency is measured by their standard. Roughly 20% of students don't graduate high school at all. The United States ranks in the middle of the pack on international assessments, such as the Program for International Student Assessment. And so the conclusion here is that there is significant room for improvement in the traditional public education system. Fourthly, homeschooling parents have amazing networks to ensure children build relationships with peers and mentors. That was another concern of the education secretary. Homeschooling co-ops and sports leagues are just a few examples. And homeschool networking is becoming more sophisticated. Former quarterback Tim Tebow was able to play football as a homeschooled student in Florida because the state allows homeschooled students to play on public school sports teams. That happens in many states around the country, but generally because parents sued to have that right. They pay taxes for that school and for those programs, but they can't be a part of it because the children are not enrolled here. Tebow went on to become the first homeschooled student to win the coveted Heisman Trophy. 
The ubiquity of the Internet means parents who homeschool have a wide world of academic content available at their fingertips, including everything from online college prep courses to computer coding academies, as well as a means of connecting with other homeschooling families. You have to ask yourself why parents would put themselves through this. Well, one of the catalysts behind the growth in homeschooling is a sense among many parents that public education is not meeting the needs of their children. If it were, homeschooling would not be most parents' option. To homeschool, these parents, in many, if not most cases, have to give up employment. One parent can't be working if the children are home and in a classroom or in any kind of an educational environment. Recent federal efforts to establish national standards and tests uh, through Common Core have heightened concerns among many parents that they no longer have a seat at the table when it comes to what is taught in their child's public school. And math and English language arts scholars are repeatedly voiced, voicing concerns that Common Core fails to prepare students for college. Government education bureaucrats are right to worry about homeschooling, but not for the reasons that Secretary King set forth. It is more likely they are worried that parents now empowered to homeschool or to select from 59 or so educational programs now in place would choose something other than a government education. And what about education in general? And what about higher education? In a world where there's no such thing as objective truth, why do we bother learning anything? And is it actually possible to learn if nothing is really true? It all revolves around the concept of objective truth. So, Schools have become merely a place where one group's ideology and opinions are planted into the minds of students because there's no absolute here in their world. Education, therefore, becomes indoctrination, which is exactly what the father of American education set out to accomplish and told us that. His name, Dr. John Dewey a psychologist. He developed the American classroom as a psychological laboratory. His words, not mine. He did that in the 1930s. The first thing he set out to do, or the first thing that is done and when the child goes to school, is to destroy their ability to read. How do they do that? They teach something called sight reading. I grew up on it. Maybe you did too, if you're old. See, spot, run. Prior to that, learning to read was by phonetics. Learning the sounds of the letters. Learning how those letters go together and the sounds they make. Did you know there were three a sounds? I didn't. In the Christian school that I started in 1989, no, 1979, we used a curriculum that taught phonetics. And I'd stick my head in, in, the, in the kindergarten class, kindergartners that were four, five, or six years of age. It was an ungraded, un, age wasn't the issue. And they had three letters, three sounds for A, and they had a song for each one, and oh, it was interesting. I learned something. With that system, those children could read anything you put in front of them by Christmas. Stood up in front of the school body and their parents and read stuff. They didn't know what it meant, but they could read it. Today, 40% of our high school graduates cannot read proficiently. Big deal. 
Yeah. They're now being victimized by propaganda, by feelings, by authority. When there are several voices shouting, differing, and opposing views, which one's right? In a world where people don't read, in a world where they're not taught to think, then the loudest voice wins. Harvey Mansfield and William R. Keenan Jr., professors of government at Harvard University, characterized how students in many schools today think in terms of education. When asked by an interviewer, John Leo, uh, this is past May, about the decline of learning on college campuses, which has been documented in several recent studies, this is what Mansfield had to say. Quote, the reason for it, I think, is that the universities have stopped pursuing truth for its own sake. They don't think there's any such thing as truth, or at least they have grave doubts about it. And that leaves everyone free to do his own thing. And then, of course, there's the multiculturalism, the belief that all cultures are equal. So, so none is better than any other. And that's because there isn't really any true culture or a culture higher or better than any other. So why, while many professors are doing their best, students are misled and generally demoralized by the view that learning fundamentally isn't possible. They can't read well. They're not stupid. In the end, he says, with this system, all you can do is indoctrinate. And that, he says, I think, is why you are seeing the lack of devotion to learning and the lack of accomplishment in learning, which seem to go together. So it begs a question. And the question was posed. So you think that the de-emphasis on learning is a direct result of relativism? And he answered, yes, I do. This relativism is a sort of liberal view in a general political sense, but it's been made much more specific by what's called postmodern thinking. Did you get that? Under the influence of relativism, many students today are under the impression that learning is not possible, that everything is just a form of indoctrination. A similar consequence of relativism is now occurring in the realm of news media. In most people's minds, there's really no such thing anymore as truth, unbiased, balanced reporting when it comes to news. It's merely one side spin against another's. So why not simply keep yourself plugged into your preferred spin and avoid everything else? Well, because that's not making a decision that's following the lemming in front of you. Because we're living in God's world. We need to know who He is. We need to know what He wants. That requires the ability to read and to think for yourself. Now do you understand why they're out to destroy the education system? Here's a, um, an old guy talking. Philosopher George, George Santayana wrote, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It's something that Plato warned us about 2,400 years ago. In book eight of his series called Republic, Plato uses a fictitious conversation between his teacher, Socrates, and Arimantus to explain how democracies, when they become too radical, devolve into tyrannies. 2,400 years ago, the parallels are chilling. Socrates maintained that democracies are transformed into tyrannies when the city, we would say the country,
becomes drunk with freedom. In America, we kicked responsibility out the door and ensconced and settled freedom in the front room. Everybody's free. Nobody's responsible. He went on to say, and that unless the leaders are able to provide more and more of it, they will be punished by the people and become accused of being accursed oligarchs. Oligarchs are those powerful people who control countries. Russia has an oligarchy. We're moving toward that. He further states that the city, quote, insults those who obey the rulers, labeling them as willing slaves and good-for-nothings. In our world, think law-abiding citizens versus radical demonstrators who terrorize communities just to advertise their complaints. He went on to say, all the while praising and honoring rulers who behave like subjects and subjects who behave as rulers. Then, then once freedom has been extended to all lengths of the nation and makes its way into the private households, it ends up breeding anarchy throughout, even among the animals. It causes a father to behave like a child and fear his sons while the son behaves like a father, feeling neither shame nor fear in front of his parents in order to be free. Furthermore, a resident alien or a foreign visitor is made equal to a citizen, and he is their equal. Socrates goes on to say that a teacher in such a community is afraid of his students and flatters them while the students despise their teachers or tutors. And in general, the young in young imitate their elders and compete with them in word or deed, while the old stoop to the level of the young and are full of play and pleasantry, imitating the young for fear of appearing disagreeable and authoritarian. When freedom is extended to its utmost lengths, there is no inequality between parents and their children, teachers and their students, rulers and their subjects, nor is there any inequality between men and women or masters and slaves. Even the animals become free. For as Socrates states, no one who hasn't experienced it would believe how much freer domestic animals are in a democratic city than anywhere else. He sums up his characterization of how far freedom comes to be extended to a democracy by saying that the citizens' souls become so sensitive that, quote, if anyone even puts upon himself the least degree of slavery, they become angry and cannot endure it. And in the end, they take no notice of the laws, whether written or unwritten, in order to avoid having any master at all. End of quote. This, then, is the fine and impetuous origin from which tyranny seems to evolve. As such, extreme freedom cannot be expected to lead to anything but a change to extreme slavery, whether for a private individual or for a city. So let's look around. Let's take stock. An entitled population that makes increasing demands of their leaders. We got that. Contempt for law-abiding citizens who pay their taxes. You can check that one off, too. An incoherent immigration policy? Yep. Adults living in perpetual adolescence. Check. Parents who have lost control of their children. Check. Teachers who have lost their authority in the classroom. Check. Disrespect for the elderly. Check. Any questions? We live in a world, in a country, that prides itself today in providing the most freedom to every citizen in it that is possible. 2,400 years ago, Socrates laid it out 
and said, this is what happens. If you do not learn from history, what? <laughs>